Good morning, everyone. As uh, uh, people walking, I'm g- just going to introduce Dr. Richard Wenderheit. Rick uh, 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 obtained his Bachelor of Science degree in Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and then he pursued a dual medical degree in Northwestern University and received his uh, PhD in 1983 and MD in 1986. And then he pursued the AP resident training in Duke University. And, and during that time, uh, he, he did a lot of research and, then, and the published uh, interesting findings in cardiac asking the preconditioning. I think that concept has been revolutionized the treatment of a patient with MI. Even though we don't have a drug for it, but I think that, that kind of study that, that, prevent, uh, that give us a way for cardiologists to how to approach a patient with acute cardiac ischemia. So he was recruited to Wayne State University in 1994 and then rose to the rank and become a full professor in 2007. Then in 2009, he moved to his current position in Louisiana State University, New Orleans. So and Rick has been a uh, administrator in multiple laboratories. So he's a director of multiple labs, and and also director of residency program for five years. And then in 2009, he became chair of the uh, Department of Pathology in LSU. And, and Rick has uh, is a very productive uh, scholar. He published you know with his research in, in cardiac cell injuries, uh, the many ischemic in, and uh, adaptations. And uh, he, he's, he, he, he has been served in multiple uh, uh, NIH study sections and also review panels. And, then, and he's a great teacher and has every year, almost every year, won award for medical student teaching. And uh, today he's going to talk about amazing structure in the heart and it's the most probably delicate, delicate and also durable structures never fails, I think. <laughs> yeah, so it's cardiac skeleton. Welcome. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, for those of you who are worried about the weather, um, I'm in New Orleans and for the month of September, now think about this, we had one day where the high temperature was less than 90, and that was 89. <laughs> so we've had an extremely hot, dry fall, and so it's very nice for me to be up here where it's actually cool. I, I showed up yesterday with no coat on. People thought I was crazy, but it was, it was good. All right, so let me see if I can figure this out. So what I want to talk about today <clears throat> is a lot, it's, it's kind of an historical um, trip through what I've been doing for the last, 25, 30 years. Um, let's see if this is the right one. Nope. Let's try this one. Oh, that's the pointer. Oh, this one's not working. Okay, so I'll just do it this way. Or maybe I'll do it this way. Okay. So what I want to do is just give you some historical perspective on ischemic injury. And then I'll spend the time talking about what I've been involved in, and that's the cytoskeleton. I got into this, interested in this early in my career, and so I'll show you some of the early studies that we did. And then later, um, as Fakwan was saying, we, we got involved in ischemic preconditioning when I was doing my postdoc and, and residency training. So then I started looking at the cytoskeleton from a different perspective um, as, as a functional, uh, important functional signaling. So. As you well know, um, ischemic heart disease, despite um, all, the, all the work that's been done over the last 50 years, still leading cause of death in the U.S. Um, interestingly, it's actually going up. Um, the, the trend was to go down, and then now the last, co- last couple of years of data have shown that it's stabilized and actually starting to go back up. So I think we're going to see with the onset of obesity, the epidemic of diabetes and obesity, we're going to start to see a, a rebound in, cardi- in uh, ischemic heart disease. But that's, so this is still an important subject that we need to be discussing. So survival and quality of life is enhanced by obviously minimizing myocyte death because the heart obviously can't regenerate itself to much de- of a degree. And so when you lose myocytes, you lose function. You lose function, you lose obviously important things that you need to have to live. 
And so really the way that we've approached ischemic heart disease over the years is to try to increase the survival <coughs> of myocytes. And so along with this, as you'll see, um, the current standard of care is to initiate reperfusion as soon as possible. Um, because every minute that you're ischemic, you're losing myocytes, so you want to reperfuse as quickly as possible and return the myocytes to normal oxygenation, normal blood flow. So this has focused the last 25, 30 years on the need for the development of novel therapeutic strategies. And a lot of this has been focused on cardioprotective interventions. And unfortunately, we haven't been successful in terms of a magic bullet or a magic uh, pharmacologic agent. So we're still working on that, um, something that we need to continue to work. So this is, uh, Dr. Jennings was the uh, my mentor at Duke, and this is back when he was at Northwestern. And so some of the original studies in 1969 looked at the ischemic injury of myocardium. And what they really showed was that the goal of the study was to examine the relationship between the duration of ischemia and the onset of what we call irreversible injury. So what they really showed was a very basic function, and that is that the longer the duration of ischemia, the more cell death there is. But more importantly, they showed that there's a certain time point, and in severe ischemia in humans, it's around 20 minutes that we call something irreversible. So in other words, that after 20 minutes of severe ischemic uh, insult, if you return a cell to, to normal oxygenation, normal blood flow, it'll still die. And so that was defined as irreversible injury. So that was an important concept because what that drove was the whole concept of rapid reperfusion, getting blood back to the heart as quickly as possible to prevent further death. So what they showed is the durations of ischemia, as I said, of less than 20 minutes were well tolerated, and they called that reversible injury. And cell death progressively increased as the duration of ischemia extended beyond 20 minutes, and they called that irreversible injury. And what they showed, and what has, um, in those days, electron microscopy, believe it or not, was really the state of the art. And so they did a lot of electron microscopy studies. And so what they did is in, the, in these um, seminal studies is that they showed that irreversible injury is associated with disruption of the membrane, the sarcoma membrane, the formation of what we call contraction bands, and importantly, what we call dense intermitochondrial granules, which were a marker of irreversible cell injury. So it was very really much a morphological-based study. So this is my mentor, uh, Charles Gunot, unfortunately passed away several years ago. But he was working with another person, uh, John Kaltenbach at Northwestern, and they were looking at something called the oxygen paradox. Um, so that what they were looking at is the taking away of oxygen and reintroducing oxygen caused... Uh, cell damage, and of course, when you when you when you kill a myocyte, you release the intracellular enzymes, and so they looked at intracellular enzyme release, and then he proposed a mechanism for what the earliest events were. The goal of the study was to determine these early morphologic events which occur in irreversibly injured cells after the reintroduction of oxygen. So what they did is they focused instead of using ischemia because ischemia is blood flow and oxygenation. So they focus specifically on oxygenation component of it. So that's what the oxygen paradox really is. So what they used was an isolated uh, perfused rat heart model, and the hearts were subjected to 60 minutes of anoxic perfusion without substrate, and then they were uh, introduced to varying durations of reoxygenation. They looked at cell death and morphology of injury, and they assessed it at different time points. So here's the model system. This is a perfused uh, rat heart. This is what a rat heart looks like. They're about 0.5 to 1 grams, depending on the size of the rat. And here's what happens when you uh, introduce significant injury to a rat heart. You get an effluent release. This is actually myoglobin, obviously. As you can see, it's red, brown. But what we did was we measured with a, an assay kit, uh, creatine kinase, which, of course, until till recently was used clinically to measure uh, myocardial infarction in patients. And so what they really just, what they focused on was this is morphology, and yeah, this is electron microscopy, you can see the mitochondria, the Z lines, uh, these are the, my, the contractile elements, so you see the Z bands, the A lines, or the uh, A bands, the M, and what you can see is they focused on something called the intercalated disc, okay, so you can see these intercalated discs, and these are the connections between myocytes. And what they showed with reoxygenation is that there's ripping and tearing of cells apart from each other at this intercalated disc region where they're connected. And they also show that the membrane lifts off the surface of the cells and actually has holes in it. So 
what they proposed was that the earliest changes were due to a contractile or contraction of the myocyte. So when you reintroduce oxygen, they tried to contract, and because there was a, an injury from the anoxia, the cells ripped themselves apart. And so it was called the physical disruption hypothesis, and it's been attributed to Gnot for a long time. So here's where I walk into the door uh, in, in the 80s. At this time, what we did know is that irreversible cell injury and cell death in myocytes was associated with cell swelling, contraction bands, mitochondrial calcium densities, uh, enzyme release, and depletion of high energy phosphates. And people were, you know, this is the obvious ischemic injury, so this is what we're really focusing on is in vivo ischemic injury um, with reflow. But other, other models had been generated to model certain aspects of this. Oh, thank you. To model certain aspects of it. Here's the oxygen paradox I just showed you about anoxic substrate free perfusion with reoxygenation. There's something called the calcium paradox, which focused on the role of calcium in the same kind of a terminal pathway. And then also there was people looking at catecholamine toxicity. So this is what we, what we were trying to figure out is how does this end up from all these different model systems all coming together in a, in a, in a common pathway. So the problem was we had an incomplete understanding really of ischemia and reperfusion injury. And so we really wanted to know when I got into the laboratory, we still really didn't know how does ischemia reperfusion kill myocardium. And so, because of the studies that, that Gnode had done with Kaltenbach, it became clear, at least to us, that um, the, the cytoskeleton, which is kind of the, if you remember, if you don't know, I'll tell you, the cytoskeleton is a series of proteins upon which the myocyte itself is, is hung, so to speak. In other words, all the contractile elements and all the ion channels and everything are associated with a very highly ordered structure of proteins, which we call the cytoskeleton. So, because of the physical disruption, I was interested in the role of the cytoskeleton. And so, this is one of the studies that I first was involved with uh, when I was doing my studies at Northwestern with Dr. Gano. And what we, we, we called it was increased myocyte fragility found, uh, following anoxic injury. So, our concept was that. <clears throat> Anoxic injury was causing some kind of a latent lesion, such that when you reintroduced blood and oxygen and ischemia, introduced just oxygen in the oxygen paradox, introduced calcium in the calcium paradox, what was happening was you were exposing an underlying weakness in the cytoskeleton. So that's, <coughs> excuse me, that's what I was working on. That was our hypothesis, and that's where I stepped into this. And so our goal was to determine if anoxia cause these cytoskeletal lesions that could predispose myocytes to irreversible cell injury. So we used kind of a, um, a clever design um, because if you remember, most of these, um, well, the models that were in, put in, in place at that time were uh, ischemia itself or oxygen paradox or calcium, but we wanted to, ex to find out if we could show there was a latent lesion without reintroducing blood, without reintroducing oxygen. So we had to find a mechanism so that we could expose this latent injury that we hypothesized was occurring. So what we decided to do was use good old uh, physiology and use hypotonic cell swelling. <coughs> Excuse me. So what we did is we perfused hearts with either oxygenated or anoxic buffer for 75 minutes, which was enough to cause um, the latent injury that we were trying to uncover, and then we followed that by hypotonics uh, perfusion. So it's important to note that when we're talking about the second phase after the 75 minutes, this hypotonic swelling in oxygenated control cells continued to have oxygen in substrate with it, but in the anoxic buffer, this hypotonic solution continued to be anoxic. So we weren't introducing any kind of oxygen or substrate, just swelling, literally physically swelling the cells. And so we looked at the morphology and extent of injury, looked at CK release. And we also, and this was kind of, at the time, kind of a cool thing. We were starting to get more immunofluorescent antibodies that we could use. And so there was actually some antibodies that had come available that were um, targeted to cytoskeletal proteins, specifically vinculin. And so we had access to a vinculin antibody, so we used that uh, to see if that had changed. 
and tried to correlate that with what else we saw, which was the CK release and the morphology. <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me, so these are pictures taken from that study. That's why they're labeled 10 or 11. But on the left here is a swollen control heart. So this is one that was perfused with oxygenated media for 75 minutes, followed by 15 minutes of oxygenated cell swelling with 200 milliosmol buffer. Now notice that you can see the cells are very swollen, okay? The sarcolem is deeply scalloped, but it's, stre it's stretched, but the intact, <coughs> there's intact Z and M band attachments, okay? So the Z band and the M band, here's the M and the Z bands are intact, okay? And here's at a higher level, you can see again, scalloped membrane, you can see that the there's connections here, and we, and we were fairly certain these were, these were cytoskeletal proteins because of what we knew about the cytoskeleton. So this is what the cytoskeleton does. It provides this structure to the myocyte. So you can expose this by swelling the cells, and this is a situation where we had oxygen. <clears throat> so these cells did not release creatine kinase, did not die, but were swollen. Now in contrast, and we did this with anoxic hearts, same 75 minutes, but this time using anoxia and no substrate, and then hypo, uh, hypotonic perfusion, you can see that we broke these, these connections, we broke the membrane, <coughs> so the membrane is now freely floating and has holes in it, and this is what um, leads to creatine kinase release when the membrane is broken, etc. So what we did is we exposed by simply physically stressing the cell after 75 minutes of anoxia, we exposed a lesion that unless you swell the cells, you would have not recognized. In other words, if you had continued to perfuse that heart anoxic, you never would have seen significant enzyme release. Over time, you might see a little bit, but this really is an explosive release. And so really what it suggested to us was that we were exposing a latent lesion. And here's a high power. These, the connections are broken. These are the Z connections. So this was the uh, enzyme release, which is kind of interesting. So basically, follow with me. This is creatine kinase release on the y-axis and the x-axis, the anoxic interval. So let's just pick uh, 75 minutes is what we use. We also do other times, obviously, but we started out with the worst case. So if you look at 75 minutes and look at 250 osmol, which is a slight, slight, slight decrease in osmolality, usually 300, 300 is normal. So this is a little bit uh, hypotonic. So you see a little bit of release, but at the same duration, if you use 200 or 150, you can see a massive enzyme release. Um, so the same duration of anoxia, just swelling the cells more severely. And if you also see this at different intervals, we did it at 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and so you see this kind of dose response curve of swelling versus enzyme release uh, with anoxic perfusion. So then, as I said, we looked at Vincan. We had access to that. So these are crude studies, uh, but this is what we had in the 80s. And so we looked at Vincan expression. A shows you a control heart. Uh, B shows you an anoxic heart. Um, and you can see that basically the Vincan staining is interesting because it's, it stains a couple of things. It, it stains the costumere junctions, which are these punctate staining along the sarcolemal membrane. It also stains the intercalated disc. Okay? So these darker stainings here are intercalated disc and these punctate stainings are the sarcolemal membrane connections. And I'll, we'll get more into this uh, the second half of the talk. We're much more sophisticated now in knowing what these proteins are at this point. But at this point, all we knew that vinclin was there. And when we looked at an anoxic heart, we could see that a lot of this vinculin was no longer staining. So this suggested to us that we had lost vinculin. And so that the latent lesion that was exposed by cell swelling seemed to be correlated with the loss of vinculin staining. So this confirmed to us anyway that the cytoskeletal lesion is developing that can be expressed. So the key takeaways that we found from our studies was that the cytoskeleton shows rupture of cytoskeletal proteins that are not ruptured by similar stress in the absence of anoxic perfusion. So anoxia, with anoxic perfusion, we saw these ruptures when we swelled the cells. We did not see the same ruptures when we had oxygenated perfusion. And of course, obviously, <laughs> this rupture of these cytoskeletal proteins was associated with release of intracellular enzymes and therefore met the criteria of irreversible cell injury. So here's some other studies that were done that we did about the same time. Um, 
all, fun all focused on this alterations in cytoskeletal or structural proteins. So we did this other study, did another study, um, and then my mentor-to-be, uh, Dr. Jennings, was also looking at this about the same time that I was at um, Northwestern, which is why I ended up going to Duke for my postdoc in residency. And they were looking at vancular and immunofluorescence as well during total uh, in vitro ischemia, and they were looking at it in the, in the dog heart. So late 80s, it looks like there was a new, 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 you know, there was new findings being shown that the cytoskeleton was important in ischemic injury, and the question is, was it really the only answer? And so at that point, we really kind of thought, this is from the Empire State Building from the 30s, this famous photograph. Um, we thought the cytoskeleton really function, functioned as a structural network. So, in other words, it was static. This was the concept that we had. So if you break these beams, obviously, the building breaks, the, height, the myocyte breaks, etc. But this was our concept, that it was very structurally based. And there was really nothing at that point to suggest in 1986 that there was a functional role to the cytoskeleton which has evolved over the last uh, several years. So as I said, we knew that the cytoskeletal integrity is critically important for myocyte survival, but is there a role of the cytoskeleton in cardioprotective signaling? And this was a question that we were fo focusing on later when I went to Duke. Because, you know, I was finishing medical school doing residency, and so during that time, of course, things had changed a bit in terms of uh, research. And so at that point, uh, there was a lot of studies, mostly in epithelial cells and cancer cells, that showed that there's proteins associated with the cytoskeleton that regulate cell proliferation, <laughs> cell migration, and even cell survival. And what also was interesting is that when we looked into this, um, it was a spe the, the cytoskeletal signaling function is especially important in organs or tissues where mechanical force is integrated <laughs> with physiological function. So, hence that's why I got involved or interested in this particular function of the cytoskeleton. So, um, one of the key proteins that showed up was called something called focal adhesion kinase, or FAC. And that turns out to be an essential mediator or a key uh, linchpin of cytoskeletal signaling, as we'll see. So then I need to take you a brief detour uh, into ischemic preconditioning. So this was originally discovered by Reimer and his group uh, in 1986, about the time I was at Northwestern, finishing up uh, medical school and my PhD. And so what they showed was that brief cycles of ischemia reperfusion that precedes us a sustained, potentially lethal, or, or usually lethal ischemic stress, prevented lethal cell injury. And so this was very shocking to the field because basically the reason they did this study in the first place is they were looking at metabolism. So the group at Duke was very big into metabolism. Uh, Jennings was one of the, you know, focused on ATP, um, high energy phosphate pool turnover, uh, mitochondrial stuff, etc. So the focus of this whole experimental protocol was to try to deplete glycogen. So what they were trying to do is deplete glycogen to see what role it had in terms of catabolic load for ischemic injury. So they thought if they used four brief episodes of reversible ischemia, they would deplete glycogen and so that when they went into the lethal longer episode of ischemia, less lactate would be produced and therefore protection from this osmotic load, which I just showed you, because at the time, the osmotic load seemed to be the important com the component of, ischemic pre of, of lethal cell death. Well, it turns out that it had really no effect on lactate, but it did have a profound effect on protection. And so it was an unexpected finding, and it was suddenly became the world's center of research in cardiovascular medicine, and Lots of groups did it, and it turned out to be the most consistent and the most robust cardioprotection. It was demonstrated in many different animal models, and there was even early studies that support the proof of concept in humans. So this was a real breakthrough at the time, and people were really excited about it, and were trying to figure out if we could harness this somehow into patients. We could really have a big effect in limited infarct size in humans. So I come in, and we're looking at fat. 
Okay, so focal adhesion kinase. This is what FAC looks like diagrammatically. It has an auto inhibitory uh, function at the end terminal. The C terminal has a focal adhesion targeting domain, and there's the catalytic domain. So basically, focal adhesion kinase is a cytosolic tyrosine kinase. And when it binds to FAC, so when, when FAC binds to integrins, it relieves the auto inhibition. So then it activates the signaling pathways associated with FAC. So integrin binding was important. And that was interesting because if you remember, integrins are transmembrane proteins. Okay, so they, were act they will actually span the circular membrane in the extracellular space and connect to the interior of the cell. So that was very intriguing because that's an obvious pathway by which integrin modulation could stimulate FAC signaling. So that was very intriguing to me. So, coming back to what I showed you before, you'll recognize this. It turns out that FAC is also targeted to the costumeers. Okay, so if you look, this is a friend of mine, uh, Al Samarel, uh, who was also studying FAC at the time for different reasons. And this is a immunofluorescent of an isolated myocyte. And you can see that same punctate staining that we saw with vinculin. Okay, so it's located here at the costumeric junction. And these costumeres are striated muscle elaboration of focal adhesion junctions. So focal adhesion junctions are epithelial cell uh, junctions, but costumeres are the equivalent in striated muscle of these focal adhesion junctions in epithelial cells. And, the, and even more interesting is that they overlie the Z-disc, as I showed you, uh, earlier in the sarcomere. So this had a lot of, a lot of important overlap for me, and I was very excited about it. Oops, that went away. That's unfortunate. Yeah, yeah, it looked quick. <laughs> but that was to show you that same swollen cell I showed you before, and you can see that. So we think that the structural stuff that we had, ex had already shown back in the 80s fit very well with what was being learned now uh, later in the early 2000s about FAC, costumeres, where they're localized and their potential role in cell signaling. So here's, here's the interesting part of this. So this is a focal adhesion contact, okay? So if you look at this, as I was saying, here's the extracellular matrix, here's integrins, okay? So they span the plasma membrane and they actually connect to a bunch of these cytoskeletal proteins, talin, paxillin, uh, vinculin is in here, alpha actinin, zixin, um, a lot of these proteins that are associated with contractile <laughs> elements as well. So these are the stress fibers, myosin and actin. And so this together, all these proteins that form this signaling complex are called focal contact proteins. And here's fat at the center of it. So when integrins are, are, are activated, it activates fat through, through the removal of that auto inhibitory domain and then fat signals through P130-CAS and other proteins it's connected with, and it can actually transmit signals from the extracellular matrix inside the cell uh, and, and, and have an effect on what the cell itself does. So what's the role of activated FAC? So it, it had been established in cell survival. So there was an established role in cell survival of these signaling cascades. Paxillin was one of these adapter proteins that concentrated, I just showed you, with these other scaffolding and signaling proteins within uh, the focal adhesions. Okay, so paxillin was also important. PI3 kinase interacts with activated FAC through its SH2 domain. So the SH2 domain binds to phosphorylated tyrosine residues with high affinity, and that, so you, we go through this signal, I'll show you in a minute our hypothesis, but you can start to see what's going to happen. So FAC activates, vaccillin activates PI3 kinase, and PI3 kinase stimulates AKT signaling. So AKT, or, or protein kinase B, its older name, was well known to show cardioprotect or uh, cell protective function. It's a well-known cell protective function. So this was very intriguing to me. So I thought, well, you know, this makes a lot of sense. FAC through AKT could be signaling the cell through, through mechanisms related to AKT signaling to protect the myocyte. So here is our, our hypothesis. So here's ischemic preconditioning, we thought, caused activation of integrins. Now this could be 
through a physical interaction. If you think about this, ischemic preconditioning, if you tie off a coronary artery, that the myocardium still contracts for a while, okay? And so when you reperfuse, it also contracts much more vigorously. So there's a real logical way to think about that intergen activation could occur through the physical manipulation of uh, myocytes. And so we have alpha and beta integrins, and they're connected to alpha actin and tailin in these, in these complexes. And so these focal adhesions undergo an assembly, um, this is our hypothesis, that ischemic preconditioning induces an assembly of these focal adhesion proteins. Okay, so now we've got FAC being attracted to this area, and it becomes phosphorylated. Paxillin's involved with it, and then PI3 kinase gets activated through the activation of FAC. It becomes phosphorylated, and it leads to AKT phosphorylation, and AKT phosphorylation leads to increased cell survival. So that's the basic mechanism that we were operating with when I took over my first position at Wayne State, 1994. So I worked with the group in Duke, learned about ischemic preconditioning, did a lot of studies there, and now as I'm transitioning into my first academic position as an assistant professor, this was the mechanism that I was interested in, in pursuing. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll fast forward here so we save some time. Um, so when I got to, uh, to Wayne State, we did a bunch of stuff looking at the role of FAC and AKT in cardio protection. So the first thing we showed in cultured neonatal rat uh, ventricular myocytes is we used a protein which is a competitive inhibitor of FAC called FRANK. And we showed that we disrupt the intergen FAC interaction and we worsened myocyte survival. So that was indirect evidence that the interaction between FAC and intergens was important for cell survival. And we, and we disrupted that by this competitive inhibitor, Frank. The next thing we looked at, we looked at ischemic preconditioning. But in this case, we did it in an isolated perfused adult rat heart. Okay, so this is a Langendorf uh, mechanism. But we did show that ischemic preconditioning in that model leads to activation of FAC and AKT and also reduced, it also reduced cellular injury and provided cardio protection. So these two studies together certainly supported our role for cytoskeletal signaling and cardio protective. Um, the overall role for cytoskeletal signaling in the cardio protective signaling pathway. So then the question became, um, as I left there to go to LSU, <clears throat> the question became, can we extend these findings into a more relevant model of ischemic reperfusion injury? And by that, we mean an in vivo model. And so the only way to do that, um, and I don't warn anybody that wants to or thinks about developing uh, transgenic mice, it takes a lot of time. <laughs> So we decided we were just, you know, we were naive. Well, we're just going to knock out FAC. Um, so we wanted to make a conditional FAC knockout mouse. And this took us probably, I'm going to say two years. Lots of trial and error because, you know, people publish studies and say, well, you know, there, there was, obviously at this point there's available um, in, inducing um, agents. There's, there's the Mercury Mare, which is, um, actin restricted, and you can use tamoxifen to activate it, and everybody just publishes this like it's no big deal. And so you take their doses, you take their, and you start doing it, and you find out there's all kinds of things they don't tell you about. So it took us a long time to do this. So anyway, the hypothesis was that a cytoskeletal based cell survival signaling pathway is activated at the level of the myocyte in response to cellular stress. And so if that's our hypothesis and we want to test it directly, so then obviously our hypothesis would suggest that if we knock out FAC, we should not be able to produce the protective effect of ischemic preconditioning. And so we did this. We were the first lab to do this, and I just told you how long it took us. So we used the alpha myosin heavy chain mercury mare system to delete conditionally FAC uh, in adult mice. Now the reason you have to do this is because a embryonic knockout is lethal. So you couldn't just knock out uh, FAC in the, in the embryonic mouse because it wouldn't survive to adulthood. So we wanted to do this in a cardiac specific manner. The advantage of the alpha mice and heavy chain mercury mare uh, element is that it's, it's, the knockout can be restricted to cardiac myocytes. 
It also has a tamoxifen responsive element so that you can activate the Cree uh, with tamoxifen administration, which is easy to do in the water or the food, whatever you choose to do. And of course, what we needed to do is take advantage of the fact that the third exon of FAC uh, was flanked by LOX P site, so we could knock out uh, FAC uh, by knocking out, by, by the surrounding of the third exon by the LOX P sites, and that would be knocked out with our, our modification. So what we wanted to do, uh, I'm not going to show you all the data because it will take too long, but I'm going to skip around and show you. So the first thing we need to do is to validate our model. And this took a long time. And then I'll go through some of the other things that we need to do to determine infarct size, determine whether the signaling was downstream of FAC, uh, et cetera. So the first thing we need to do is to validate our model. So again, here's our LOX P sites. Here's the exon, the exon 3 of FAC. And if you look at this, it forms a 1.6 kilobase uh, long sequence. With the cremated excision, it becomes a 550 base pair uh, fragment. So you remove this exon, it goes from 1.6 kilobases down to 550. So to confirm that we had genetic recombination, this is our DNA, our, uh, our gel. And so what you can see, so the fat control FAC C is a Cree positive, floxed, FAC positive, but no tamoxifen was given. Okay, so FAC C should <coughs> contain the 1.6 kilobase fragment, and it does. Okay. Now the reason that it's larger than control wild type is because it's got the responsive element, in it. so it goes from 1.4 kilobases to 1.6 because you've got the LOX P uh, responsive site in there, so it makes it a little bit bigger. Okay, so. So the controls did not have any expression. Oops. And then we had to, I guess, let me go back. I thought we had another slide here. So there should have been another bullet down here. So basically then we did this in a tissue-specific manner. And, we, and if we add, so we have the same element here, the knockout would be this, but we would act, add tamoxifen to activate the uh, excision. So when we do that, we can see that in the heart specifically, we generate the 550 base pair fragment that we're looking for to show us that yes, we've, ex we've successfully excised the, uh, the FAC exon. And here it shows you that lung, liver, skeletal muscle, and aorta uh, as control tissues did not show this. So it's very, it is restricted to, to myocytes. So then, um, this is an interesting little thing that we discovered as well. Should have thought of this, um, but you know, FAC is, expo is expressed in more than just uh, myocytes. So when we were looking at grinding up the heart looking for FAC, um, it, it wasn't easy to determine whether there was a loss of FAC. So what we ended up needing to do was to isolate the myocytes itself. And so when we did that, um, to isolate just the myocytes, because of course there was a, a, my a myocyte specific knockout, here's the wild type uh, FAC, it's about 125 kilodalton protein. Here's the experimental control, and here's the knockout animals. You can see that we knocked out essentially all the FAC uh, in the myocyte population. And the controls were um, Cree-positive, flox FAC negative, but were treated with tamoxifen. Okay, so they, were, they got the tamoxifen, they just didn't have the flox FAC element, but they also had the Cree-positive element as well. All right, so we determined that we, you know, we generated this model. It was appropriate. We knocked out specifically the myocyte, the FAC. And so the next study, the next part of the study was obviously to determine whether infarct size and precondition and non-preconditioned FAC knockout mice was different. So here goes back to the standard Jennings protocol and Reimer protocol for preconditioning. They used a 40-minute occlusion for the test episode, followed by reperfusion. Ischemic preconditioning is a series of five minutes of ischemia and five minutes of reperfusion. We used three cycles, followed by 40-minute occlusion, and then reperfusion. So if all goes well, as I'll show you, when you do preconditioning, the amount of necrosis that you measure after 24 hours of reperfusion in this group is much, much less than it is in the control group. So that's what you would expect. So our experimental design, we had wild type, we had experimental controls, which were Cree positive, flox FAC negative, but treated with tamoxifen to control for any tamoxifen effects. And then the FAC knockout group was Cree positive, flox positive, treated with tamoxifen. So this is the group that we, we would knock out FAC in the myocytes. <coughs> 
in the L groups we did control and ischemic preconditioning. All right, so here's the, <coughs> the data. Of course, in any infarct, experimental infarct model, you need to control for area at risk to make sure there's, uh, the, the amount of myocardium at risk is the same between your groups, and indeed it was. These indicate the number of animals in each group. Wild type control, control versus preconditioning, the area at risk is the same. You know, the same you know, it was the same in all three uh, basic groups. Here's the money on a slide because here shows you the control of the infarct study. So this is the infarct expressed as percent area at risk. Wild type control, right around 42% of the area at risk was necrotic after the 40 minute occlusion. With preconditioning, it's reduced down to 20. So it's around a 50 60% reduction in infarct size. With our experimental control, which were treated all the same except they didn't have the flux element, no difference. We still get protection. And then with the FAC knockout animals, where we don't have FAC and we do preconditioning, we lose the cardioprotective effect of preconditioning. So this was very encouraging, exciting to us, and suggested that obviously FAC is important to signaling that is, is responsible for cardio protection. So the next thing obviously to, to bring this home is that we needed to examine the cardio protective signaling downstream effect to make sure that our FAC knockout was also inhibiting the signaling that we knew was, was, was present. So again, here's our hypothesis. So remember we've got preconditioning, um, activating this assembly, FAC, PI3 kinase, AKT. So these are the things that we're going to look at. PI3 kinase, AKT. So, does ischemic preconditioning induce FAC activation? That's the first basic question. So we looked at phospho-FAC, okay, and we see that wild-type Phosphorylation at the 397 tyrosine 397 site compared in ischemic preconditioning compared to control is increased. So we do activate <coughs> FAC in our model system. The next thing we wanted to do was to look for, as I said, the phospho uh, PI3 kinase and AKT signaling because FAC was re you know signaling FAC, FAC signaling was activated, but then in our knockout animals we wanted to show that this would be not activated, whereas in the control, because FAC is activated in preconditioning, these should be phosphorylated uh, in the control animals. So here we go. Uh, this is PI3 kinase, um, wild type versus knockout. Here's PI3 kinase. We're looking at uh, phosphorylation at 85. Um, and you can see that with wild type, uh, PI3 kinase activation occurs compared to control. And with the knockout, there's no difference between control and uh, precondition. Similarly, with the phospho-AKT, which is the activated form of AKT, the same kind of a result. In wild-type animals, we see strong activation of the AKT signaling or phosphorylation. And then with the knockout, it's, uh, it's eliminated. So, in summary, um, our alpha minus nine chain MCM uh, mercury mirror system was 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 used to delete fact while avoiding deficits in cardiac function. I didn't show you that data, but we had to show that, you know, when we knocked it out, there was no. We went three months. Uh, we looked at these mice for three months to make sure there was no alteration in function, and that over three months they were stable. They didn't de deteriorate, so there was no no problem with uh, the heart function at all by deleting fact. We also didn't show you this data, but uh, the aged mice, I said three months, we actually went out to six months, um, displayed normal stress tolerance. I didn't show you this data, so there was nothing uh, inherently uh, detrimental about knocking out FAC uh, in the myocytes in the mice. And then, of course, the key findings were that FAC knockout abrogated the protective effect of ischemic preconditioning in a well-characterized in vivo myocardial ischemia model and that FAC knockout prevented the ischemic, precondition, ischemic preconditioning induced activation of key survival si uh, kinases. So of course this work was done by this group. Um, Adam at the time was my MD PhD student. He's now doing pathology resident. He's a third year resident at Emory doing pathology. Uh, ben unfortunately, he was my surgeon and he got recruited to a biotech company in Colorado. I couldn't afford to pay him what they were going to pay him, so I lost him. 
And Fanny's my uh, my right hand person. She's still with me. Uh, she's my technician. So they're the ones that did all the work. Um, I just was uh, helping them interpret the data. So any questions uh, about this? So basically, I'm giving my feelings on the set of skeleton. What I haven't shown you is a bunch of stuff I did back at Northwestern, and this will tie into the people. Hopefully, there's some people in the audience that are, are Duchenne muscular dystrophy people because membrane rupture um, at the time in the 80s, we thought about it was the sine qua non of, of, of cell death. And um, I did a whole bunch of other studies with isolated myocytes because I was. Um, at the time, there was very few people working in isolated myocytes. I went down to work with Ruth Otschold as a student to learn how to isolate myocytes. And so, and of course, my mentor, Gunot, was interested in contraction and contraction band formation. So we did a lot of studies in myocytes um, for different reasons, looking at ATP dependence of contraction formation and things. And what we found was very interesting and hard for me to understand at the time. But if you if you take isolated myocytes, you can round them up. Okay, there's three basic forms to a myocyte. There's the rod-shaped normal form, there's the square shape, and there's also a round ball type. And we always considered the rounding up would be cell death because you would be contracting the myocyte and it would, it would rupture and die. Well, it turns out that's not true. When you first round them up, um, they're still functional. So the contraction and the distortion of the membrane by itself is not enough to kill the cell. What really is important is the combination of high energy phosphates, calcium, the interaction between all three of those things, the membrane integrity, the levels of ATP, and the levels of calcium. So there's like this window where you can actually titrate calcium and ATP, and that's what we thought Shell was doing, um, where you can have a cell with a membrane break and it's still not dead because of you control the ATP and calcium levels. So there's the cytoskeleton when I was in the 80s, I mean, we thought it was all that. In other words, if you broke a membrane, a cell was dead, there's nothing you can do. But I'm not so sure that's the case. I think if you break a membrane, um, at least for a period of time, if you can prevent that cell from dying, it might be able to repair itself. Uh, the membrane could reseal itself. Um, I haven't done those studies, but would be very interested in, in doing some of those studies um, because I think coming back full circle to where I started, I have new ideas and new uh, things I'd like to test. But anyway, that's that's my story in terms of the cytoskeleton. It started out as being very structural, and then we found a very important cell signaling uh, role for it. So, yeah. How do you transfer some of the data that you get from your experiments to uh, standard clinical care where you have a patient with uh, just a machine myocardial infarction and then maybe another patient with myocardial infarction A with me who needs to be resuscitated? Can you transfer any of this to the care of those patients? No, unfortunately we can't. Um, I'd love to be able to. Um, again, when ischemic preconditioning was first defined, it was thought to be the golden fleece, you know, it was going to be the answer to everything. We could figure out what the mechanism was, we could design a drug to activate those signaling pathways, and we would fix everybody. Uh, fortunately, it didn't turn out that way. Um, but remember, preconditioning came along after many, many years of study of free radical scavengers and other things that people had used, neutrophils. People were worried about neutrophils causing, you know, reperfusion damage. Lots of things were going on in the background of this, so when pre preconditioning came out, it was really innovative in the fact that the heart itself was protecting itself and so it was very exciting but unfortunately we've really never been able to translate um, that to clinical work because obviously patients don't come in before they have a heart attack okay so they come in with chest pains too late I mean you've got to reperfuse at that point I mean it's not like they're going to come in two days before and say well I think I'm going to have a heart attack in two days can you go ahead and precondition me uh, that would be great but obviously we can't yeah <coughs> In ischemia and perfusion, calcium signaling is the primary uh, you know, cause that leads to cell death. So I was wondering how a track at uh, the calcium signaling is. We haven't looked at that. 
I haven't looked at the calcium signaling with that. That would be very interesting. Um, you know, people, the FAC pathway which activates AKT, AKT um, has been shown to work through modification of mitochondrial uh, pore transitions and uh, apoptosis pathways. So there's, there's downstream pathways of AKT that people have looked at, but I don't think anybody's looked at specifically calcium fluxes or calcium cycling um, in relationship to FAC signaling. That would be interesting. Yeah. So in epithelial cells, the AKT signaling and the uh, adrenal junction uh, maintenance of the active kind of opposite. Like if you activate AKT, you, you disrupt the adrenal junction by disrupting the cadaveric complex. Yeah. So, so yeah. In the, uh, so here, is there any interaction with the end cadaverics or AKT in the cardiac microphysics? And how does, does that work? Well, myocytes, so it's a good question. So an epithelial cell, you know, so AKT and all this stuff is important in epithelial cells because it's cancer, right? So it's a growth mechanism. So AKT activation is bad because it, prevent, it allows cells to grow and to continue to be viable. Whereas in the heart, paradoxically, from a cancer perspective, that's a, a positive thing because you want to save the myocytes. So that's the difference. But the, the signaling pathways and the proteins that are involved are, are similar. So that's why... When I first put this grant in uh, years ago, I went to a special emphasis panel because I was on study section, and uh, unfortunately I went to three epithelial biologists, and they said, we know all there is to know about FAC. We don't need to do this because we know it works this way. Well, the point was no one looked at it in myocytes at that point. But, I mean, there's a lot of overlap between the signaling pathways and the proteins. Just curious for the, for the focus assembly, have you compared the reverse for your ribs or I don't. That's a good question. I don't know if it's disruptive whether it can reassemble. That's, that's an interesting question. Yeah, I don't know. I presumably it would, um, but I don't know. I've never directly tested it. All right. Well, thanks everybody for your attention.